welcome to our fall 2023 preview. As members of the sales and marketing team here at Charles Bridge, we're excited to talk to you about some new favorites, familiar faces, and some STEM new releases. So I have some new favorites to talk to you guys about. First up, we journey back to our favorite teacher, Mrs. Hartwell. However, it looks like Mrs. Hartwell is nowhere to be found. In fact, neither is the substitute teacher. In Sick Day Jitters, releasing in both hardcover and paperback, we explore what a sick day is like in the Jitters universe and how to cope with the challenges that arise. I personally love the different point of views in this particular story. On one side, we see the kids going through the day with the math teacher teaching reading and the school nurse even teaching science. The other scenes feature the journey Mrs. Hartwell is taking eating a bowl of hot soup, endlessly blowing her nose, and disinfecting her surfaces, as she should. <laughs> Interspersed between each scene, we get an electronic update about the goings-on in the classroom. So the name of the series here is Jitters, and as it shows, some of these students have a bit of a hard time adjusting to the change during this hectic day. What do you all think about the status updates that are sent during the day and the differing emotions with them? Well, I have to say my favorite part of the whole book were the emails that she would see receive throughout the day. I think it did very well in representing the highs and lows of, and the chaos of school. One of the things that I love about this series too is Julie Janiwerk, who the author is actually a teacher by trade. She's now retired, but she has tons and tons of classroom experience and so she gets it just right about both the jitters of being a teacher and like handing over your class for the day to the substitute and then how your kids are gonna react. And I also love that she's brought it into the 21st century classroom, right? Gone are the days of the sub plan is when you roll the TV and now I'm dating myself and watch the movie. Like she does it in the online por portal in the online cap classroom. She gets updates daily and then she kind of, you know, moves electronically from there. Now, Mrs. Hartwell has always reminded me of some of my favorite teachers growing up. She's always displayed a very social emotional approach to learning and I think that's utterly needed in today's school age children. Why do you guys think that educators should be excited about this particular addition to the Jitter series? You know, the first title in this series is actually First Aid Jitters, right? That has been around, I, I can't even tell you, countless years and it was ahead of its time because it's the, the tagline for the entire series is everybody gets the jitters sometimes. And so I really think that there's this moment where teachers are allowed through the, through the Jitter series to acknowledge that both kids and their grownups, kids and their teachers, students and the adults in their lives are all gonna have these emotions and there are lots of different ways we can deal with them. So this next title is one that will undoubtedly pull on your heartstrings. Get the tissues ready, please. Absolutely. <laughs> Our Wish For You takes readers along the journey of an open adoption and the hope parents project for their child's life to be filled with love and family. Now, Dana Moreno tells the story of a birth mother who wants to find the perfect parents to adopt her baby. She finds two fathers who also share that wish and in turn, a new kind of family is created. So this title is so unbelievably sweet and tender and gentle. Um, what was your guys' reaction upon reading Our Wish for You? For me, it was like a finally moment. You know, finally, like an adoption book, non-traditional family, and also incorporating like the mother into the lives. It was exciting to finally see something like that. There are so few titles on open adoption too, because that's one of the things we talk about when things come to acquisition for us, right? Is there anything like this on the market? And I think this entire team was shocked that we couldn't find a ton of other open adoption stories, even though open adoption is so prevalent in the US. You know, I think the other thing that I love, and again, talking about pulling at your heartstrings, the message here is there's no shortage of love to go around. You can't love a baby too much we're showcasing a normal relationship that is, you know, becoming more and more of a, you know, family dynamic nowadays. You're normalizing in an open adoption here. There's not a, there's not a unique approach to it. This is just standard operating procedure. And I love that. And I love that Dano writes from which he knows, right? This is a lived experience title for this author. Absolutely. Yeah. He pulled this story from his and his husband's own experience with adopting their son through an open adoption. It celebrates the process of adoption and the growth of family and love for one another. You know, and I think stories like this are more important than ever too, because there's this backlash, right? With book banning and book challenges and like kids need windows and mirrors and books are this 
opportunity to connect with things that or people or places or experiences or everyday lives that they may not necessarily see within their own community or have access to, but can have access to through the pages of the book. Also for the child themselves who's being adopted, I think this book is really good for them to finally see like, there's a lot of love for them. You know, there's that stereotype that you were adopted or even the thoughts of the kids themselves that, oh, you were adopted, you're not loved as much or something, you know, you were abandoned, whatever. And like this kind of book, fights against that, and I think that's really great. So in Babo, a tale of Armenian rugwashing day, we join young Tato and her family in the excitement of rugwashing day, which is an Armenian tradition that they experience with their Babo, or grandmother. In Tato's world, rugwashing is a day of delicious Armenian snacks, endless bubbles, and quality time with her Babo. So Astrid Kamalian masterfully delivers a story of cultural family traditions and invites readers to splish and splash along with Tato, Babo, and their family. I really resonate with this quote from Astrid. So she says, as an Armenian, I don't see myself anywhere in contemporary Western kid lit. If before the war, our community was talking about how we wish there were Armenian picture books, now we talk about this being an essential need. It is a literary desert that we must fill with our voices now before someone destroys and appropriates into oblivion what we have been creating for centuries. That's a lot to kind of take in all at once, but what are your feelings about that message from Astrid? What she said just like really resonates because like I come from a Native American background, so it's like the same idea. Just like try to make sure people understand what your culture is and like getting those little in-depth details and you know, just sharing that with everybody is huge and it's very much needed. I think there's a lot of untold stories out there. And I, I think that's really truly what Babo is does a good job of is it is it really makes you think about this beautiful culture but also your own family in in turn we will now take a look into the making of babo with author astrid kamalian and one of our senior editors here at charles bridge karen boss hello everybody my name is karen boss and i'm a senior editor at charles bridge publishing and i am so thrilled to be here today with astrid who is the author of a new picture book that is coming soon astrid can you introduce the title of your book and your name and a little more about you. Hi everyone, I'm Astrid or Astrid Kamalian. I'm so excited to talk about my picture book today. It's Babo, a tale of Armenian rug washing day coming out on September 19th, 2023. So let's uh, talk about the book. It's about a group of kids washing rugs. So can you tell us a little bit about why you wanted to write a book about that? It's a happy childhood memory and I had a very happy childhood growing up in Armenia and uh, I actually wrote the first draft on a very cold Chicago autumn day. All of a sudden this very happy image of my childhood memories comes, me and my babo and my siblings washing rocks together and it was instant. I knew it, I need to write about it. <laughs> That's excellent. So the word babo means grandmother in the specific um, type of Armenian that you grew up speaking, right? Yes, yeah, so this uh, this is Artsakh dialect and I am from Artsakh and all my grandparents are and my, my wonderful babo, she would speak to us in Artsakh dialect. And for me, this dialect, it's how my happiness and delicious food and love sounds to me. Um, when I want to say something to my kids in a way that sounds very authentic and endearing, I say it in Artsakh dialect because that's a very different and special place for me to be. Um, so in this book, I actually included a few phrases in Artsakh dialect and that's what makes the book especially delicious for me as I read it to my kids. You know, I hear all these words and I hear my grandma's voice um, and all the things that she said to us and the way she would address us. She would say, Mataganim, which means my dear, you know. Oh, that's lovely. So your book has a group of kids in it and it's a little girl, Tato, and then her siblings and then a friend from nearby. And they're working together with this older woman to do a very sort of difficult task actually right so can you talk about the joy in the book and and how you think that this will resonate with kids around doing chores with family if you talk to the kids who grew up in the 90s armenia that's 
what all of us shared a very joyful childhood. But the reality of it was I grew up in a post-war Armenia and we didn't have access to basic resources. I mean, things like water, electricity and gas, we only had for a couple hours a day. And sometimes we would only have water at midnight for two hours. However, we were surrounded with so much love and joy, such strong family connections and such a strong sense of community in general that it created this sense of joy that I took into my life. And I think nobody can ever take it away from me. So that is what I wanted to express in this book. That's wonderful. And I think that it's important really appreciating not only the end of the day where your mom gives you a, a delicious snack, but also the middle of the day when you're working hard at something and you're doing it well, right? And the idea that you're old enough now to participate in this cool thing too. Oh yeah, it was always, like you said, a cool thing. None of this we ever perceived as anything but play. I mean, we always thought, oh my God, rug washing, this is our favorite thing. Now, as I talk about the book with my community and I meet other Armenians, I have not met a single person who doesn't say, oh my God, rock washing was one of my favorite things to do. And we did so much work that could be perceived as work by grown-ups or boring people. Like we would wash the wool and then we would beat it and help it dry. I mean, it was hard work. Washing wool for your mattresses, come on. Nobody does that here. But we, for us, it was just play. A lot of things are just play for kids and that's what makes it so fun for them and joyful and how they learn actually. That's wonderful, Astrid. It's just been so fantastic to work with you to make this book come to life. And so can you talk a little bit about, um, we were so lucky to get a Nate on board as the illustrator. Oh my goodness. Can you talk a little bit about your reaction to the illustrations and her work? So Anahit, her illustrations are sunshine on a page. You open the book, the sun shines through it. I mean, just look at that. It's, this is one of my very favorite spreads. I, I don't know how I got so blessed and lucky. <laughs> I was her fan for so many years before I even knew I would ever get published. Um, I was following her on Instagram. And when the contract for this book came, um, I asked my wonderful agent, uh, Karen Grantic, I said, is it like, there is a wonderful Armenian illustrator. I would really love the illustrations to be authentic. I know that authors don't normally have a say, but this time it was very important for me, especially that it was after the war in Armenia. I really wanted to represent my culture. I can't imagine it being anybody else. Like it, she is as perfect and she as a person, I mean, we got to talk a little, she's such a wonderful, positive and kind person that all of that beautiful energy is on the page. So one last question, what do you want kids and grown-ups to, after they read your book, what do you want them to kind of come away with? What do you want the most important thing that they take from your book to be? I want them first and foremost to experience the immense joy of being welcoming an Armenian family. I only put one friend character and three sibling characters in a book, but in reality, we're five siblings. And every time we'd sit down at the dinner table, we would never know how many people there are gonna be because all of our friends completely randomly, they didn't need any special invitations, would come over and my grandma would cook for all of them these delicious dinners. I want them to take away this sense of being welcome and being celebrated and just feel warm and happy and safe wherever they are. That's excellent. So do you have any last things you wanna say before we close out? Oh, just, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you check it out. It's called Babo, A Tale of Armenian Rug Washing Day, coming out in September, 2023. I hope you get to really enjoy this very ancient tradition and uh, I hope it will be a little more tangible for you now. So Jerry Plata is no stranger to the Charles Bridge world. His alphabet collection has sold millions of copies and are detailed and bursting with information. In fact, he has two books releasing this fall U.S. Coast Guard Alphabet Book and the U.S. Air Force Alphabet Book. Both books take readers on a trip through the A to Z's with each letter covering Coast Guard and Air Force related topics. I really love the way that Jerry Plata takes 
a simple concept like the alphabet and pairing it with a complex topic like the U.S. Coast Guard, the U.S. Air Force, these military institutions. And he turns it into a factual journey that I think even older readers, you know, like people who may have been in these institutions will really enjoy. The Charles Bridge List actually started with five Cherry Plot Alphabet books, and he's been called the Alphabet Man for a reason. Um, I just think he understands kind of what kids are looking for in terms of bite-sized facts and also how an alphabet can really work for all ages. I love too that Jerry has now given us all five branches of the military with each of their individual alphabet books covered. Especially in like the Air Force, you get to see like almost like a timeline of the Wright brothers. So I also think that this has a really big appeal for holidays in particular. Um, so we've got Veterans Day and July 4th. These books kind of fit in that market really well. It's a really great option for either families that have military active or veteran status and also anyone looking for collections for those patriotic holidays like you mentioned or information about kind of our U.S. history. Kids are smart. They're little sponges when it comes to learning and that is something that should be fostered. The best way to nurture a child's curiosity is with STEM books. And I'm proud to share the books that Charles Bridge has for the fall. First up, I'd like to introduce Ruth Spiro, best-selling author of the Baby Loves Board books, now coming out with How to Explain Science series, with the first book titled How to Explain Coding to a Grown-Up. The perfect book for four to eight-year-olds to learn how to communicate with their grown-ups about what coding is, where it's used, and how it's done. Hi everyone, I'm here with Ruth Spiro. Thank you so much for joining me today. Happy to be here. I am so excited to talk to you about your new upcoming book, How to Explain Coding to a Grown-Up. So let's jump right into it. Okay. What inspired this new series? Actually, this series was inspired by the many educators, librarians, and parents who absolutely love this board book series and shared it with their youngest listeners and readers, but they also, they liked the content, but they felt that they couldn't really bring it into their kindergarten or first or second grade classroom because of that one word, baby, that some older kids thought that even though the material is kind of complex, they just felt like this was a baby book and it wasn't for them. So we had the great idea to start a picture book series just for this age group. Love that. Was it any different writing a picture book from a board book? Yes, it was quite different. Now, I do have a lot of experience writing other picture books. Um, and the difference is that when I'm writing a board book, I have to take the information and distill it down to the very most important parts of that topic. And I also need to consider the fact that it's really for very young children. So what I do is I take something that they would be very familiar with, such as watching a bird fly. And I sort of pull back the curtain and explain what the science is behind something that a very small child would be familiar with. Because really everything around us can be explained by science, right? When we see a bird fly, it's not magic, it's science. But these books are only 10 spreads and they're very short. So I had to pick out the only the most important aspects. But with a picture book, you have a lot more room to explore the topic and play around with it and add some fun elements and, and more humor that an older child will understand. And we have some really fun diagrams and it almost has like a graphic feel to it. It's not just straight text. And I think this is great because a picture book will be read to a child, but there will also be some kids that will be starting to read and, and trying to read this on their own. And I feel like when you have these small little parts of text that are broken up, it just, it's a lot easier for them and they can follow along with the pictures and figure out what's happening as well. And we also have a glossary with information about the different words that they may not be familiar with. And I always like to send kids off with something to do after they read the book. And so this asks them to look around their home and their neighborhood and see how many computers they can find. And computers come in some very surprising places. 
Um, and so this hopefully will inspire them to look around and notice all of the places where computers are being used that they might not have thought about previously. So there's a lot more that goes into this and my research folder went from this thick to this thick. But I think kids will really enjoy this and, and parents too and, and educators because there's some stuff in here that I didn't know before I started doing the research. And I, I do hear that adults like learning along with the kids. So um, I think this will be a fun next step. And in your research, so you worked with a coding expert. Uh, her name is Allison. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. How was it working together and making this science more accessible? It was so much fun. Allison is a longtime friend of mine and she's a software engineer and she's been working in the field for more than 30 years, I think. I can do a ton of research, but when somebody who does this for their life's work looks at it, they might see other nuances and things that like, oh, you might want to add a little bit about this or, you know, change this a little bit. And there's actually some examples of code in here, which she wrote for us. And she even ran the code through her computer to make sure that everything would work properly. Um, so sh she's very detail oriented and she did a fantastic job in filling in some of the holes in my knowledge that there might have been and also just confirming that everything in here was completely accurate both the text and the illustrations and that's something that's very very important to us both with the board books and the picture books we always have an expert that reviews the text and the art to make sure that everything is completely accurate because our kids deserve that right um, oh, yes. so it was really fun to work with her because she's a friend but she's also really really good at what she does well that is so exciting and i'm so glad that you have started this series and i have to ask what's next well there will be as of now four books in this series i am not going to reveal the exact topic so stay tuned but this one comes out in the fall of 23. There's more coming out in 24. And you'll just have to stay tuned and check in on our socials because we will be revealing those topics really soon. But for now, this is the most exciting thing that I have had happen in a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. Fine. Keep me on the edge of my seat. But I am, again, so excited for How to Explain Coding to a Grown-Up, which comes out October 10th. And I am definitely buying this because I cannot <laughs> wait to have my niece teach me how to code. <laughs> I'll sign it for her. <laughs> oh, <simple. laughs> well, thank you so much, Ruth. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here. We have a little bit of everything when it comes to our STEM books. I have to say, for me growing up, rocks were always just rocks. Imagine my surprise when I go to middle school and learn that rocks aren't just rocks. <laughs> um, but it was like an entire science field. Hands on Science Geology by Lola M. Schaefer introduces young children to earth science as she invites them to, into a geology lab to explore rocks, minerals, and fossils. Drusilla Santiago's clean and simple illustrations bring experiments to life, creating a fun interactive STEM picture book for children inviting them to make predictions and to flip the page and find the results. Welcome to the Geology Lab. Here you can have fun exploring rocks, how they're made and how they change. Feel free to touch, pound, scrape, press, and examine any rock on display. Open the door to begin. What do you think it is about hands-on science geology that attracts the little readers? I think it's because it's a little, Bill Nye the science guy makes every two legs press here, right? It's the fact that it's interactive. There's tons of white space it's meant to be engaging and fun without feeling like you're having having to learn science, right? Lola Schaefer has tons of experience teaching little kids and making it feel like play. And that comes through with every line break, with every vocabulary choice, and then paired with Drusilla's tons of white space and really colorful art. I think it's this like science experiment in one neat, clean, easily cleaned up package. Absolutely. I love the fact that it's a geology book. Mm -hmm. I think rocks and fossils are so fascinating. You always have a rock collection as a kid, right? Pick something up. Oh, it looks shiny. Like, I think that this really speaks to those kids who were those big, again, hands-on sort of children as they grow up. And I, I think that 
that this book is specifically for them. Like, it's just so much fun to, as you say, interact with it. Mm -hmm. I love how accessible and it also invites you to go out into your backyard, out into the world, and to do those same activities, to go pick up rocks and try to classify them and figure out what you're looking at. And that's, I absolutely love that. I also want to point out that Lola and Drew aren't done yet. They still, they have a whole series and the next one up is Hands-On Science Motion. Yeah. So now um, we have matter, geology, and we're going to have motion. Interactive is the theme this fall as we, we also introduce How Does Chocolate Taste on Everest? An immersive round the world venture where readers are the explorers. Any budding survivalist will enjoy this book as they're invited to explore Earth's most extreme places through sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste. Lisa Stewart Sharp warns readers not to get too comfortable that they were about to go on a wild adventure. Paired with Erin Cushley's fun and colorful illustrations, readers get to visit places like the world's longest river, the Nile, or the world's harshest place, the Outback Australia. What are you most excited about this book? I love a good informational, like, atlas book. And I think that this delivers not just that portion of it, but I also think it delivers cool facts. Like, kids love to know, I love to know, quite honestly, like, the world's most randomest facts. And I think that this book helps me, honestly, with my trivia game. But also, like, just to know about all of these really cool places that are on Earth right now. I love this is, that this is for armchair travelers. I never have to leave the comfort of my house or my office. You know, page after page, you visit a different continent without having to pack anything, remember your passport, or figuring out where you're going to go next. For me, it's the humor. There's humor throughout the entire book, right from the first page, which was the note to the reader, and then it just keeps on going, that same humor through the entire book, including like those little letters to the mom and dad they send back. So it's, it like really like creates an environment that the readers feel like they're on a true adventure throughout the world. And that's what I love. If you had to choose one of the places in the book to visit, where would you go? I'm gonna go to the most magical. They say Greenland is the most magical of all the places they visit and I'm in. Ooh, that's a good one. I really like the most secret place in the world, which is the Amazon. You know, there's miles and miles and miles of forest that is, you never know what's underneath those treetops. And I think that that's a really cool kind of mysterious kind of place to go. <laughs> I would have to say I'd go to the world's most electric place, which is in uh, Venezuela. The spread is one of my most favorite because of how the illustrator did it with the, the lightning strikes splitting up the panels for you. It's gorgeous work and I'm a huge, huge fan of a good thunder lightning storm. Do you know that game Mad Gab where you read a sentence and then the other people have to try to say it, like guess like what you're saying? Yeah, it's just like random pieces of words yes. to, to yeah. match together. So, well, try this. Lady Die of Amateur and Priscilla Sidwell. Lady Die of Amateur. Diameter. And Priscilla Sidwell. Yes. Percent. Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. Diameter and Percent. Two concepts of math, but also the name of the two leading ladies of circumference in the 100% goose chase. In this next installment, which is book 12, by the way, of the circumference series, Cindy Nushwander introduces kids to percentages. Accompanied with illustrations by Wayne Gian, Cindy brings her readers on a medieval adventure to Gaggleston on Greed to deliver Priscilla's flock of 100 geese to the townsfolk. But geese go missing on the way and now Priscilla and Lady Di need to figure out how to make sure the customers get their fair share of the flock. So for the circumference series and this book specifically, what do you like most about it in the series overall? I love that we lean heavily into the puns. If you are a pun lover, you need to pick up this series. We are here for it. We are here for the medieval humor, and we want the wordplay for sure. You're really bring, making that math literature connection. As a kid who loved humor and hated math, I wish I had this book. Well, and the thing that I love, Cindy's also a teacher by trade, and you know, she wrote these for elementary schoolers, but we hear all the time as Charles Bridge staff that these are used from pre-K all the way through high school. Let's not forget that this is in the medieval times also. It's truly like an adventure in the past, which like for me, I've always been fascinated by medieval times and to get these little glimpses in a fun way that just so happens to introduce math, like it works for me, it works. Yeah. <laughs> this season also has some lovely familiar faces uh, returning to the list with some new adventures. Now, as a mom of a three-year-old myself, 
I love that Chicken Soup for the Soul Babies imparts good values through heartwarming and humorous stories to help little ones put their best foot forward. And this season's adventures, a gift for me, I want it, and say thank you, but why, are especially timely given that we're heading into the winter gift giving season. I love that these two titles put them in little kid relatable terms about the opportunity to be generous and to be grateful. What do you guys appreciate about this series? I think this series does a wonderful job of taking what can be kind of considered like a big thing to teach to a toddler, you know, like compassion and kindness or sharing. The Chicken Soup books do a great job of bringing those topics to these toddlers and showcasing that it's, you know, in a simple and easy way for them to understand, but they're also getting something huge out of it. I think also that the books did really well in picking and using the language that the kids would use, the, ch the little, little ones, you know, but why? Or, you know, I want that. My brother has six kids and they're all little. And I literally, as I read through the book, like I could picture them saying these, these responses. Well, and they seem like small things to us as adult, but adults, but they're big feelings for toddlers. Wanting something, having to understand to be patient, to be grateful, to say thank you. These are big life lessons. And Chicken Soup for the Soul does a really lovely job of making sure that these social, emotional, learning, developmental pieces are accurately displayed and really easily kind of accessed. The other thing I really like about this series too is I am old enough to remember when these came out for me as a kid. So I love that we have now parents and grandparents sharing these with kids and grandkids. This is a trusted brand that's coming to an entirely new generation of pre-readers and readers. Our favorite toddler has a new adventure in our beloved Leo Can series with Leo on a hike. Leo and his daddy are ready to get moving and head outside. After all, today is a perfect day for a hike and Leo is excited to explore. As they head out on the trail, they see tall trees, tiny flowers, and even some crawling bugs. You know, I love a ton of things about the series because it's not just a simple adventure. They do things like snack on crunchy crackers, share a juicy orange, and even find a delicate feather and a bumpy pine cone. All of these toddler ready kind of experiences, right? What do you guys love about Leo? Those are some of the best description words I've ever heard. <laughs> There's nothing better than going on a hike with a little kid and stopping every five seconds so that they can touch the squishy moss or, you know, they, they can run after a bug. I, it is what can be a chaotic kind of day. Actually turns out in this book to be a beautiful day spent with dad. Um, and I just, these descriptors that they use are just so perfect for that age. And it models really a healthy, active lifestyle too with them getting outside. Anna McQuinn has always been on point with all her books from <clears throat> Leo, the Leo series and the board books to Lola's series. Like she just captures the moment so well. And in this case, it's with, you know, Leo and his dad and, you know, the curiosity of a child going out into the world and just seeing so much new stuff and just wondering, like, what are they looking at? What does it feel like? And why to explore all that? She has really gotten this like perfect day in the life read aloud concept down in the Leo Pan series. Perfect for toddlers and their grown ups. All right, y'all, I am just so excited that we have new board books from Grace Lynn in our storytelling math series. I actually had a chance to sit down with Grace and her editor, Alyssa, and they had some pretty great things to say. Shall we take a peek? Want to tell me a little bit more about what they do and our favorite apples and who jumps more? The whole concept of storytelling math is to show how math is in kids' everyday lives. So it was really important to me to just show kids doing uh, everyday things. So I was looking very closely at all the things that my kid did with her friends and the everyday things they would do and see what I could take from that to make into books. So for example, our favorite apples. Uh, one of the things we live in New England, one of the things that we do is we go apple picking. It was like just a very easy storyline to like, look, they're gonna uh, have them pick apples together. Like I said, New England, there's a lot of snow. <laughs> <laughs> so they always play together in the snow. And so just trying to find examples of how you could see the math in things that kids do every day. 
So Alyssa, we've got these great everyday concepts and I'm with you, Grace, apple picking and playing in the snow, amazing for New England. How do we pair that with math? What concepts did we come to for these two books? So for our favorite apples, well, the kids pick apples and they've got red apples and yellow apples and green apples, and then they sort them by color. So they each have their favorite apple, but then they find these three apples that are all three colors. So what do they do? And so with that, the math, the math gets a little more complicated, right? Now, now you have to realize, okay, well, do we make another category? Like, what, what do we do? So there's creative problem solving. I love really. that sorting and classifying too, and that problem yes. solving that's so perfect for this age level. Cause I mean, you really do have very literal thinkers in two and three year olds, especially, right? And when you pose a problem to them, as in you have these apples that were green, that were red, now what do we do with these? They do stop and think, and they are gonna make a decision. So we're talking about sorting and classifying, then what are we gonna do with who jumps more? Well, it's about measurement and proportion because May takes these giant big leaps like a deer and Olivia takes these little jumps like a bunny and they're like let's jump to that tree who's and they, so they do and then they look back at their footprints and they notice there's a difference in their footprints so then they say well who jumped more all right so that, that's really talking about math and language mm -hmm. well I love that too because you're trying to teach even on a basic language understanding level too that different words have multiple meanings, right? Or different interpretations. And so you're having that conversation and you're allowing kids to express what they think something is and also allow them to see somebody else's opinion. Grace and Alyssa, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about the two newest adventures in the Storytelling Math Board book series. For those of, those of you that are listening out there, please, please, please don't hesitate to check out charlesbridge.com slash storytelling math to see even more resources about the series. And please come September 19th, check out our new releases. Hola a todos, aquí estoy con el libro. Estamos agradecidos, soy Ali Heliga, que es un libro que sigue la nación Cherokee en la manera en que ellos Uh, celebran las bendiciones y las dificultades que cada estación del año les trae. Este libro fue originalmente publicado en inglés en el 2018, pero como a todos les gustó tanto, pues lo estamos trayendo para hispanohablantes ahora. Uh, una de mis partes favoritas de esto es que la autora, ella misma, es de la nación Cherokee. Y mi super parte favorita del libro es que tiene también un silabario Cherokee en la parte de atrás, así que puedes leer el libro en español, pero también puedes aprender a hablar en Cherokee. Así que disfruten. Hoy gente, hoy estamos con Ana Crespo uh, y vamos a hablar de sus libros. Uh, entonces, ¿cómo fue la pesquisa de dos libros? La pesquisa fue más complicada de lo que parece, ¿no? Los libros son simples y todo, ¿no? Mas o que es el objetivo de la historia, son historias simples y de fácil acceso, pero la pesquisa fue más complicada. Para Liam Lees, Who Has More, la pesquisa fue muy gostosa, porque <risos> incluyó coxinhas de galinha y biscoitos de polvillo, mas além de comer, yo también <risos> pesei las coxinhas y los biscoitos, cada uno de los biscoitos, medí todos ellos, porque así a gente sabía que no final das contas ia ter o que estaba aparecendo nas páginas do livro realmente poderia ser verdade, ¿no? Então a gente sabia no final o quanto isso é um un poco de un spoiler, mas o cuanto que a, a guia tinha que tirar da coxinha dela para botar no prato do Luiz, para que eles pesassem a mesma coisa. Então, tudo isso foi verificado matematicamente. Então, a, 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 o livro é bem simples, a, a ideia do livro é simples, mas o, o, a pesquisa foi mais detalhada do que pode parecer né, para um livro infantil. E para o puzzle, infelizmente, não, tem, não teve nada de, de comida, <risos> mas teve é, é, muita pesquisa também para ver o, o tamanho das peças, o tamanho das peças em comparação à mão de uma criança, é, muito trabalho a, atrás das cortinas, né, dos designers, para conseguirem fazer com que as peças não, não, não sejam repetidas na página, que apareçam de um jeito que as crianças entendam como funciona. Então, foi, foi mais pesquisa do que parece para dois livros que são para crianças novas, mas foi tudo muito divertido e deu certo. Muito bom, então, 
os dois livros estão disponíveis para pedir no website Charles French. Hola a todos, hoy vengo con un libro nuevo para enseñarles que se llama Mil Mariposas Blancas, originalmente publicado como uh, Thousand White Butterflies. En este libro seguimos a Isabela, que se acaba de mudar a los Estados Unidos desde Colombia y está bien emocionada para empezar la escuela. Lo único que pasa es que la escuela, ella está entrando el segundo semestre y cae una tormenta de nieve. Entonces ya pues no puede ir a la escuela, las clases se han cancelado y ella se siente bien triste, no tiene amigos y no es un país nuevo, así que ella tiene que aprender a navegar, a navegar esas emociones y en el proceso pues se disfruta la nieve, se aprende, conoce una nueva amiguita y hasta tiene conversaciones sorpresas con gente que ella ama. Así que se los recomiendo mucho, esta historia toca mucho en la inmigración, en la, las familias este, que son diferentes, tal vez no todos los padres están en el mismo lugar, Así que es una historia bonita de aceptación y de nuevas, nuevos comienzos.